Hello everyone, I'm, I'm Mercedes Sinovchik and today I'm pleased to host a super salon with Dr. Tara Smith. Hello Tara. Hello, good to be here. Dr. Smith is a professor of philosophy at the University of Texas. Dr. Smith's main interests concern the nature of values, virtues, and the requirements of objective law. Her most recent books are Egoism Without Permission, The Moral Psychology of Ayn Rand's Ethics, The First Amendment, Essays on the Imperative of Intellectual Freedom, and Judicial Review in an Objective Legal System. Hello again, Tara. So the topic of today's discussion is both Ayn Rand's ethics as a whole, but in particular, Tara's latest book on the moral psychology of Ayn Rand's ethics. And so, as probably many know, Ayn Rand is known, maybe uh, pro most probably known mainly for her ethics of egoism, for advocating ego egoism. Uh, so, could you tell us, Tara, what's the whole deal is Ayn Rand really for that egoism that which is vilified? What does she mean by egoism? What is her view in general? Yeah. Uh, so, yes, you bet she's for egoism. Now, she has a very distinctive idea of what that means. So it's good to immediately want to clarify that. But yes, she wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness, and she meant it. Um, she also used that word knowing it was provocative, but we can talk about why she used it. Um, so yeah, basically what she thinks is each human being ought to pursue his self-interest. I mean, that should be his primary interest in life. That is to pursue his well-being. You should do that. I should do that. You know, the guy on the street should do that. Why? Because human human well-being is a wonderful thing, right? And we, I mean, normally we don't apologize for that. We think, yeah, we want human beings to flourish. That's why you go to the doctor. That's why you bring your kid to the doctor. That's why you advise your best friend, man, you got to get rid of that guy. That relationship is bad. It's keeping you down. It's not good for you, right? Her ethics is oriented around the ideal of human flourishing, of human happiness. I mean, it's Somewhat like the Aristotelian, it's somewhat like the Aristotelian ideal of human flourishing. And the only way to get that though is through living one's own life in a certain way. Other people can't give you happiness. Other people can do all sorts of things for you that are real and beneficial and important and you know sometimes major. And again, we can talk about that more if you want. So it's not that other people can't help you, but the kind of satisfaction and reward that comes from that, that is actually having a good life, being happy, having well-being. That's the kind of thing a human being can only make for himself, get for himself, achieve for himself. So if anybody's going to get that, then you've got to go after yours and I've got to go after mine. And I mean, so that's one angle. That's one way of coming at what she's saying. But she definitely advocates egoism. Um, it's rational egoism. It's not doing whatever you want to do. It's not just sort of fly by night, emotion by emotion, worship of my feelings just because I feel that way. So, you know, there are other people historically in the history of philosophy um, and people without any particular philosophical school affiliation who sometimes advocate what's known as egoism, but most of those views are quite different from what Ayn Rand has in mind. She has in mind a reasoned, thoughtful, thought through idea of what will be a good life for me? What will it be for Tara to flourish? What kinds of values will that involve? What will the composite be? And how can I lead my life on a you know day-to-day, week-to-week basis such that I'll be achieving that and furthering that. Maybe you did touch already upon it, but I think a lot of people would start by pointing out that, okay, Ayn Rand is from egoism. He even, she even lists uh, virtues that we should obey. She gives us guidance. But many would ask, does anyone need guidance on how to be egoist? 
isn't that easy or automatic? Yeah, um, I wish that is. I, I wish it were, it were easy to be really good at achieving one's own interest. Um, so I guess two quick observations on this. One is to return to something I said a minute ago that just quickly, right? Egoism isn't do whatever you feel like. That's easy, right? Go with the flow, go with the mood. You feel like it, do it. Like to do that, that would be easy and simple. That would be a no brainer, but that's not truly in your interest. And anybody who thinks about it for about three seconds realizes that, right? So she's not advocating do what you feel like. Now, I think that part of why Part of why that view, you know, egoism, it doesn't really take guidance. Come on, that's just automatic. Part of, I think, why that view gets off the ground is that most of us, I mean, the overwhelming majority of people worldwide are raised with the idea you should do for others. Morality is this sort of set of constraints against what you want to do or, or against what you might think is good for you. So... If she is, in effect, releasing us from altruism and a duty, dutiful conception of ethics, where it's just this set of constraints, maybe they came from some god up in the heavens or somewhere, maybe they're just arbitrary from nature, but wherever they're from, you just got to do them. And yeah, it's too bad. Too bad you have to be moral. It's sort of a pain in the neck. It's sort of a constraint, but that's what morality is. So... Once she rejects that, it's very natural, I think, for some people to conclude, oh, so if I don't have to do that, then the, the alternative, as if the only alternative is, I can do whatever I want to do. That's like release, liberation, amen, last day of school, right? But again, no, that's not what she's talking about. The other angle I would bring in here just to, you know, to have people question that assumption that it's easy. Think about times when you have perhaps faced some somewhat difficult decisions. I'm not saying they're you know, the most momentous in life, but you, you want to do what's good for you. You want to do what will be in your best interest, but it's kind of hard to figure out which thing you should do in order to do that. Let me make this concrete. You know, I've got this car that's 11 years old and the last two or three years, man, I've put a lot of money into the repairs. It's basically been a really good car and it continues to be really good. I mean, I, I won't I won't milk the details here too much, right? But I think you're all familiar with this kind of case. Like, well, I've already put this much money in, so now should I spend the next twelve hundred dollars? But you know, when do you reach that point where it's like, oh, maybe I should just scrap it now and get the new one or something, right? I want to do what's gonna be best for me, right? But it's not always apparent what that is. Just, I don't know, to alter the example, you're, you're, you take political and you, you take political issues pretty seriously. You're seriously thinking about running, let's say, for the local school board or some, you know, city council or whatever. But, you know, that would be a big change in your life to serve on the board or the council or whatever it might be. And, you know, that involves a lot of time, a lot of self-educating about the issues on a maybe more much more detailed basis than as a voter or just a you know a normal member of the community um but you really care about certain issues and you don't you think it's really dangerous what's been going on and so on I mean, you've got so many variables to weigh, right what's this going to do to my family life how much time is this going to take hey i could campaign and run and thrust my heart into this and i could lose right i mean there are a million things to where I want to do what's really going to be best given how much I value this and see that in the scheme of values. What should you do for your own self-interest? Hardly obvious. Now, again, those are just a few examples. But, you know, do I want to pursue this major in school? Do I want to pursue this kind of career? You know, do I want to stay with this kind of career? I enjoyed it so much in the early years, but these recent years, it's not doing the same thing for me. Should I scrap it? Are there ways I could revise what I do within the field and so on? So again, um, I think we often oversimplify when we talk about egoism. We, we act as if self-interest is obvious. You know, it's easy to, you know, to see what's in your self-interest, let alone do it. And no, uh, What's really going to be all things considered, 
full context best for you, for your flourishing, not just to give you a high today, not just to make you feel good, right? She's not talking about the high of drugs. That's not the kind of happiness that you, that you seek uh, or that would be your genuine self-interest. But for real self-interest, there's a, there's a lot of thought that's going to have to go into it. And, and again, the, her, the ethics, her moral code, you mentioned, you know, I'm glad you did, the fact that she thinks there are real moral virtues and values that one needs to pursue a happy life. Those are going to be of great help in guiding you as you make some of the more personalized decisions about how to, how to achieve a good life. So given that Ayn Rand's view of egoism is not, let's say, a simplistic hedonism, what is the role of emotions or desires in her view of egoism? So emotions are important in the sense, well, they're important in life. I mean, the whole point is to enjoy your life, to enjoy your life, right? You've only got so many years, make the most of it. Have a good time, right? Have a satisfying life and so on. So satisfaction, enjoyment, they're at the heart of what the whole picture is about. We all feel like, scores of emotions all day long, you know, some minor, some major, you know, some are in the background, but you're feeling little ups and downs or big ups and downs and, and all sorts of complicated emotions and, you know, anxieties and so on. So emotions are a very natural part of life. Rand opposes emotionalism or using emotions as the basis for your decisions. And, you know, she stresses it's rational egoism. As I was saying a few minutes ago, it's not just do whatever you feel like, okay? So it's not emotionalism. It's not guidance by feelings. But what some people take away from that is the thought, and this is a complete mistake, but they, they think, so Rand must be against emotions. She must think you must distrust emotions, keep them at bay, suppress, don't feel, and far from it. Far from it. But what she is against is this idea of making your decisions simply on the basis of your feelings. Feel your emotions. Examine what they come from. Like, why am I feeling that? What am I, like, I'm afraid, let's say, of something. Like, why am I dreading that meeting that I'm kind of afraid of next week at the office? You know, what is it about? Like, try to understand the basis for your emotions, the beliefs that are underneath them, the valuations that are underneath them, so that you can figure out, is that an emotion, you know, does that lead, does that give me actual reasons for doing one thing or another and so on. But, um, and again, in the new book, I have a, a chapter devoted to desires, which are not just the same thing as emotions, but talking about this idea that desires are, I mean, they get the whole thing off the ground in a certain sense. If we had no desires, nothing could be of value to us. But the sheer fact that we desire something or feel a certain way about something is no proof that our feelings are justified. I mean, again, let me just give you a quick example, one that I'm sure we're all familiar with. You get really angry at somebody because it turns out you've misunderstood what he did. Like you thought he was guilty of a certain offense or, you know, slighting you in a certain way. And it turns out you completely misunderstood the, the, um, the situation. Doesn't mean you didn't feel that way, right? But the feeling was not justified or the anger, you know, that you felt wasn't justified by the feelings being accurate about, oh, I thought Ark had really just, you know, ignored that commitment that he made to me and so on, where in fact there was something else going on. I can't hear you, Ark. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I muted myself. Okay. So you you spoke about the importance of examining emotions, examining their roots. And in your book, you do touch a lot on the issue of introspection. So could you expand on how, what is the role of introspection in Ayn Rand's thoughts, ethical thoughts specifically? Um, yeah, 
Yeah, that's such an interesting area. Um, some of you who may have read Ayn Rand will, particularly some of her, fic her nonfiction, um, although this arises in some of the fiction as well, you know, a kind of tagline uh, that she uses is check your premises. Like check your assumptions, those things that you take for granted, however popular they are, however prevalent they are, however often you've heard them and everybody says them, whether they're prevalent at all, whatever your particulars are, just check your, like rethink that to make sure it's true. But what people miss, I think, is that she also talks about and thinks it's a really good idea to check your own kind of personal premises, not just your philosophical beliefs, right? Not just check your philosophical assumptions, but look within. So introspection as opposed to extra, looking at the world around you, observe reality. She's big on that. Okay, observe, use your senses and your rational faculty, but observe within as well. Do some probing, do some digging. In particular, try to understand your emotions and what they're coming from, as we were talking about a few minutes ago. But by introspection, I mean, examine your thoughts. Examine why, again, a lot of it is examining your emotions and really try to probe to figure out why you're thinking what you're thinking. Why? What's the good of this? What's the point? If we don't understand ourselves well, we can't do the best job of leading our lives well, of choosing our values, of choosing our friends. I mean, here again, I think it's sometimes easier to get a perspective on another person than it is to get on oneself. So sometimes in friendships where, you know, it's a pretty close friendship and you've known this person for a fairly long time, right? I mean, there obviously we have friendships of many different dimensions and degrees, right? But with some friends, you know them pretty well. And sometimes you can see them getting in their own way. They seem blind to some of their own not so healthy predispositions. You know, can't you see you're making the same mistake with him that you made with the boyfriend, you know, two years ago, or you're doing that same thing with your boss that you used to do, right? Sometimes it's a lot easier for us to see this in other people, but we have to be aware that, you know, sometimes we're getting in our own way because we're not realizing really what's motivating us or what's going on for us, right? Maybe I'm doing it this way because of those insecurities that I still have from the way my father used to talk to me when I was eight years old or something, right? But if I don't realize that because I'm not introspecting enough to find out what's really going on for me, then I may well continue the same patterns and make the same mistakes. And in effect, you know, I mean, one example would be not go for certain goals that I really should go to because I have these insecurities that I haven't examined. So, you know, no, I could never get that. So I won't put in for that grand proposal or that job or what have you, or I won't try with that woman or whatever. So, you know, to do anything in life, we all know, we all learn. You need to know, well, okay, I've got this job. What are my resources? Like, how am I supposed to accomplish this? What are my resources? What are the conditions? What are the constraints? Well, one of the important factors in doing anything is who's the team? Who's, you know, who's in charge here? Was it whether it's a, you know, a 10 person team or a solo job? Who have we got here? What are their strengths and weaknesses and skills and so on? Emotional, intellectual, all, right? So the better you know yourself, the better you can figure out what you need to work on, where you need to make some changes, make some improvements, right? And how to tackle, you know, what comes up from the external world. So how can we determine whether a desire is irrational and to be followed instead of being harmful, being uh, driven by some unexamined altruistic premises? Well, I mean, there are really two questions there. The one is the more general, just how can you, you know, how can we think about our desires to assess them? And then there's the more specific about um, altruism. I mean, in terms of, and I might even ask you a little bit more of what you mean by this, but I don't think there's some distinctive way of thinking about desires versus 
a lot of what I've just been saying about thinking about emotions and trying to question what's really going on. For, like, gee, I've been noticing I'm really dreading this meeting. Why? What the hell about this meeting? Right. And you've got to dig some. And the answer doesn't always come immediately. But if you realize, ah, you know, like there's something going on here. You know, if you dig long enough or over a few days, you might find, ah, this, this, I'm really afraid I'm, I'm going to be exposed that I am an imposter, that I don't know my stuff, you know, as well as other people on the team or whatever it might be. Oh, and that, then you can figure out or you can address the question at least, well, is that true? Do I not know my stuff as well? If not, why is that? Am I not doing my homework as well? Or am I just intellectually inferior or what, you know, but so you can, so you've got to examine desires, emotions, very honestly, almost, you know, scientifically to figure out what's behind them and then fit them into the larger context. So you raised this, this specific question more about desires. Okay. What would be good if I gratify, if I take action to try to gratify what desire, what would be bad about that? What would the full impact be on these values of mine, those values of mine, short term, how would it make me feel? What would it give me short term? Not just make me feel, but what would it give me? What would it give me long term? And so, you know, what will all the reverberations be? So it is a matter, again, this is why, you know, it's rational egoism. It takes a lot of thinking. I don't want to overcomplicate this or make it seem like, oh my God, you could barely get from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. because you're, you know, you're going through uh, the stations of the cross over everything. Uh, but so there's, there's a lot. You've just got to put things in context, be honest with yourself in examining the roots of desires and how they would shake out in terms of your larger values. Now, what was the more specific thing you wanted to ask about um, altruism, I guess? Could you say a little bit more about what you have in mind there? So the question was, what guidance can Rand give us, Rand give us in terms of detecting altruistic premises well okay yeah um, good yeah. so i say good because this is this is an area where my new book really tries to to uh probe something uh a little bit more ex directly i think than rand does which is um and i mean simply just building on her here not saying anything i don't i hope not to be saying anything contrary to what she says but one of the things that I've realized over many years, so, I mean, I started, my interest in objectives and dates back to, you know, my teens, okay? So I've been with this for a while, all right? And, you know, pretty taken with it and pretty much accepted the basics of the ethics for decades now. Yet I found that I would still have feelings, inclinations, to do these altruistic things that I reject. I don't think that makes sense. And again, altruist, I mean, we can talk about what altruism is, but that doesn't mean never do nice things for other people or have no benevolence or anything like that. But I would find that subconsciously without meaning to, I'd still be pulled in certain altruistic directions. So that's a lot of what I actually try to address in the book. I think we've got to appreciate how tenacious so many of the ideas either that we've absorbed that, I mean, there are really two points here. One has to do with what you get in childhood really leaves a deep impression. So if you get certain ideas in childhood, not just about ethics, but whatever, it can be, it can take a lot of work as a lot of people in therapy will tell you, right, to unlock these things. The other thing is when ideas are so prevalent in the culture around you, so taken for granted, just in the woodwork of the ideas that people have, it can be really, really difficult to weed those out. And that's what needs to be done to really hook, line, and sink, or get rid of egoism. So it's one thing, I think, you know, if, if some people, they read some Ayn Rand, and after, what you know, and they read some more, and they read some more, and they think some more, and they decide, yeah, I reject some of these older ideas that I used to have, maybe about God, maybe about um, ethics, or certain political ideas, and so on. It's one thing to reject, or, or let's put it this way, it's one thing to explicitly reject 
certain ideas. It's another to really get them out of your system, to really expel them fully. Because the mind has this, you know, there's there's a lot of subconscious going in and going on in our minds. And that's what we just pick up without even noticing. So it takes some conscious work to do the, the weeding out of, I think, some of the mistaken premises, such as altruistic, you know, feeling like, oh, I've still got to do this because it's a family obligation. Okay, now what's the basis of family obligations? Like, do I really have to do this? Why exactly? Just, well, no, it's just a, it's just a fixture in my mind from childhood. You, thou shalt spend Christmas with grandma. You know, whatever the, the pros and cons of that in a given year, whether that really makes sense for you to make that trip and so on. What do you think are some of the main psychological barriers and challenges that people face when trying to practice egoism consistently? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, some of it, I think, is just what we were just talking about. That is these sort of hangovers from, you know, that you haven't fully gotten out of your system. But I do think, um, I hate to call it this, but there's, well, so, so I won't call it that. People like to be accepted. People like to get along with other people and to be liked. I mean, just by and large, broadly, people like to be among like-minded people and thought of as a normal person at least, right? And to buck the conventional wisdom, right? To embrace selfishness as good. To say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not, you know, when everybody else at the office is volunteering for the charity campaign, you know, we're all going to do this on Saturday afternoon. And for you to be the one person, that one weirdo, who's going to say, no, no, that's, you know, that's my afternoon for cycling or whatever. You don't mean recycling. You mean just your own cycling because you like to cycle? It's like, yeah, like, hey, it can be really uncomfortable, really awkward. And I just think, so, I mean, that's just an example to try to indicate. It takes a lot of independence and self-confidence in your own judgment, right? Now, again, one should embrace egoism and all of one's specific values very thoughtfully. This shouldn't just be a cavalier thing, okay? But if you're committed to certain values as more important than others, sticking with that when everybody around you is against that, that can, you know, that takes a lot of spine. That takes independence, that takes integrity, that takes a certain kind of social courage, okay? And I think that's one of the real barriers that, well, yeah, I want to be an egoist. Man, I read this stuff and I'm all fired up. But when the going gets a little uncomfortable, it's, you know, it's tempting just to go along. So I think that's one of the phenomenon that, that occurs fairly often. Now, you know, when that occurs, if you notice it, even after the fact, it's like, damn, you gave in there. Okay, but notice that and think about why you gave in and what do you really value more and what do you want to be and what do you want to do? So, you know, it can all be figured out through more thinking. This kind and of the point, you know, And the point isn't, the point isn't, you know, thou shalt not act in this way or that way or thou shalt feel guilty if one gives in to something like that. The whole point, again, let's go back to where we started, right? To have the best life you can have, right? To have a flourishing life, a genuine life of well-being, where you've thought through and continue to think through and update, you know, what is that going to be? Is that going to be this kind of work? Is that going to be having a family? Is that going to be having two kids or what? And is it you know, going to be spending time with the guitar or with whatever? Um, so you've got to be thinking about what's really going to be the best life for you and putting that together and not being apologetic about that. The pursuit of happiness is not a guilty pleasure. You know, it shouldn't be treated as a guilty pleasure. Yes. Uh, could you maybe expand more on how can one deal with the psychological hangovers from altruistic upbringing, either from culture or simply family? Deal? I, I, I'm not sure exactly how do you deal with them. Um, I mean, 
so again, there's how do you deal with your own, which we've just been talking about, in terms of around you, you know, ask questions. Just asking questions to challenge certain ideas. You don't need to do this in a nasty way or an adversarial way, but genuinely looking for, well, what's the thinking underneath that? When you assume that this is the right thing to do, or when you praise that commencement speech that that guy gave that was all about serving others, like, what is it about that that's good? So, I mean, I think one way to kind of counter and battle bad ideas, and one way to understand ideas, simply understand, not just battle, right? But one way to understand all ideas, good, bad, and different ideas you don't yet know what to do with, how to evaluate, right? Probe. Check premises. What are the foundation? Like, what's the reasoning here? And with honest people, you can have some really informative conversations to find out why they think that, right? And, and I mean, sometimes it's things you wouldn't have thought, you wouldn't have expected. Sometimes it's very predictable. Uh, sometimes you can easily see what's wrong with it. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes it gives you a new angle on something that you've got to think about further, right? But I think one way to just improve all of our lives is to ask more questions honestly, not threateningly, but looking for the reasons, because we should have good reasons for the things we do, for the things we value, for the things that we teach our kids to value, right? So you want to ask questions of others, of the things that you read, you know, in the magazines, on the blogs, and so on. And again, you want to introspect, you want to ask questions of yourself, of, you know, do I really, like, why do I believe this? Do I just believe that because that's what the objectivists say? You know, and I want to be a good objective. Or do I do I understand the reasoning underneath this? And it's like, yeah, I get that. When looking at the methodology that speaks throughout both Rand's texts and those of yours on on her ethical system, uh, what strikes me. Uh, maybe, maybe because because of my political background, is that neither of you aim at some kind of an algorithm, at uh, let's say decision making algorithm, let's say uh, where we have where we have a simple rule that will tell us how to make decisions, like pursue uh, pursue the greatest amount of happiness or for the greatest number, uh, obey this rule that rule. And instead, and instead, you, you know, for example, you speak of simply asking questions. Rand speaks of uh, of questioning, checking one's premises. Mm -hmm. Do you do you maybe have some comments on the methodological differences between looking at some kind of an algorithm on how to live instead of what both you and Ron present? That's a really interesting question. Um, and just one thing I'll say is, you know, yes, I was a moment ago talking about asking questions. Obviously, you want to answer the question, right? You want to, you want to eventually, you know, but you got to ask to answer, right? You start with questioning and be curious, and then you try to figure out. But no, I, I think the contrast that you raise is instructive. I think it's a helpful one. Because again, if you think of the way that most people, not everybody, but you know, I have a lot of people around the world. Morality is about commandments. God damn it, God said it, so thou shalt do it, right? It's, it's about commandments or it's about rules. It's about Immanuel Kant, the categorical imperative. You know, act only in this way that you can universalize the maximum of your action or whatever. The, I mean, the mill that you bring up, the utilitarian, you know, here's the rule, here's the calculus, the greatest good for the greatest number. And you can parse that in many different ways. And there are, you know, 13 dozen variations of what counts as the utility that is to be magnified and so on, right? But there's a rule or there's a set of rules. One of the things about these rules that's troublesome, again, when you question and think about them is they often, again, not always, but many of them are arbitrary. Many of them are just these kind of commands from the sky or from duty or justice or their intrinsic goods, or we can intuit them, whatever the hell that means, right? Um, as opposed to, 
So it's true that Rand is and objectivism and I like doesn't give you an algorithm. Doesn't and, and I mean leave algorithms it doesn't give you a formula. It doesn't give you a neat template. But it gives you guidance in the form of the major virtues. So again, rational egoism, the master virtue in Rand's account is rationality. But she articulates several derivative or more specific values, such as, and I talk about these um, in my, I have a book, not this most recent book on Rand's ethics, but I have another book um, on her normative ethics, where I devote a chapter to each of her virtues, honesty, justice, integrity, independence, pride, productiveness, right? These are fundamental sorts of guidelines, and she has very specific things that she means by each of those. These are general principles that you will then need to apply to the specifics of, you know, making that decision about, uh, you know, should I pursue this kind of work or that kind of relationship or put more money into the car or whatever, right? But these are the kinds of guidance that are, she thinks, realistic to the kinds of situations that we face in life where we need guidance from knowledge, which is what principles represent, knowledge of the kinds of activities that are most conducive to human well-being. And again, you know, I think of the medical analogy and health, health for human beings, health for animals, you know, the veterinary health and so, you know, the, that you go to the doctor for. Well, you know, the doctor can't give you an absolute formula of, you know, there's no guarantee, there's no algorithm. You do this, you take that, you know, and, you know, this will be the result. No, results may, may vary depending on, you know, particulars of your physiology and your case and your whole situation and so on. But we have learned this. We have learned that from medical science, that this is the way, you know, the best way to flourish, to be healthy. Uh, and it's somewhat simu similar in that, you know, there's a flexibility isn't the best word, but you've got to be very you know, alert to the actualities of a particular situation to figure out how to apply the principles. But there is no kind of cookie cutter formula such that I can shut off my mind and just apply the algorithm, you know, to use your, uh, your idea. Um, no, that's not going to do it. Partly why, partly why I'm asking this is because what one can observe in her theory of knowledge that when she speaks, when she tries to give normative guidance on how to think about reality, she also doesn't give any kind of algorithm. And it's and it's kind of interesting how many philosophers in that area also want to give some kind of an algorithm in terms of some calculus. And the other reason is that this non-algorithmic way of giving people guidance reminded me kind of of Hannah Arendt where she spoke about Adolf Eichmann and the fundamental reason why he did what he did was that he was not thinking and that one of the fundament and Hannah Arendt made a fundamental principle of her ethical system simply to think and uh, so in both cases in both in cases of Rand in cases of Arendt here we have some non-algorithmic non-formal norms which nevertheless ne nevertheless are worth reminding of because uh, as you explained at the beginning even the obvious isn't automatically automatically applied um, yeah yeah no, again, I think that's a really interesting observation that you make. Um, Rand has a great essay, and it's sort of the beginning of her ethics, and it's, it's what I always point people to if they're interested, if they don't know anything about Rand's ethics, maybe they've read some of the fiction, uh, the novels, but she has an essay called The Objectivist Ethics. Actually, it's in the very beginning of, she has a thin book called The Virtue of Selfishness. 
and both really one should read both the, the brief introduction to that book and the essay the objectivist ethics but in contrast to something i was talking about a moment ago these sort of this understanding of ethics as a set of arbitrary commands or duties or rules or whichever specific form they take an arbitrary set of things you just got to do and rand begins with the question in effect why be moral where does morality come from not as a historical question or an anthropological question but like conceptually what is it like morality good bad right wrong where do those ideas come from? What gets them off the ground? Do we need those ideas? Do we need to say this is good and that's bad, right? So I raise this because her whole approach to morality is in a way very scientific, right? So we're here talking about methodology and algorithm and so on, and you may have, you know, people naturally associate those with, oh, the scientific headset. Oh, look, she's very scientific. She actually calls ethics a science because she finds an answer to this question, like, who needs this? Oh yes, we need it. We need to, we need, literally need, human beings need to distinguish the good from the bad because our lives depend on it, quite literally. Now I hope that intrigues you a little bit such that if you haven't, you go back and you go back and you look at these two essays or intro in this essay that I just referred to. But we actually, because our survival is not guaranteed, is not automatic, we need to distinguish what's going to be healthy for us and not healthy. Um, we need to use our minds, our rational faculty. That is our mode of surviving. It's not just, hey, we happen to have reason and the plants don't. We need to use our reason in a certain way so that we can figure out what will be good for us, bad for us, what will be conducive to our survival and our flourishing and what will work against that. So. On the one hand, no, she doesn't give you a formula, but she doesn't just give you feelings, right? It's, she gives you a very causal explanation. And this is something else that I stress at certain points in the book and, and that she stresses in some of her work. Morality is causal. If we have certain ends, then we must respect the facts that are relevant to the achievement of those ends, you know, rationality, demands that such a rationality demands it because reality our survival our flourishing coming back to again the happiness that's at the end of this whole selfishness thing by the end i mean that's what it's all for okay but yes thinking also to come back to your um your hannah arendt and the the thinking thing if reason as i said a few minutes ago being rational is the master virtue for rand the master vice is evasion, the refusal to think, right? I mean, it's one thing to make mistakes. It's one thing to make an honest error, to misunderstand, to not get something, to not get a certain connection or relationship and not understand. That can be completely morally innocent. But to look away, to not want to know, to evade, that's only going to hurt you. So that, that's not good, right? It's, oh, be, be conscious, be, you know, focus, ask why, why do you think that? What's under, like, do that premise checking, do that thinking, do that introspecting. That's the path to greater understanding and that's the path to better decisions about making our lives what we want them to be. This is a place where I would like to open the questions to the audience. So if someone would like to ask anything, feel free to unmute your mic and and jump in. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so Tara, I have a question. Do you have advice or thoughts on maybe material or for applied egoism, like how to apply egoism in like a personal way, like getting past the kind of intellectual arguments for egoism to say, okay, if someone says, yeah, I should be selfish, I should do that. So how exactly uh, what's the best way to then to apply it? I mean, I've, some things we've touched on, you know, introspection and stuff like that, but is there any material or about really how it's to a, apply it? At, at the risk of, of, of plugging myself, um, okay. I'll plug the, the, the I'll show it to you. So <laughs> this book, Ayn Rand, so this is the one, let's see, 
Ayn Rand's normative ethics, this is the one that's, it's on her virtues. So it's basically seven chapter. So it's honesty. What does she mean? So part of each chapter, like I think I have the same basic template in each of the chapters. It's what is it? Why is it a virtue? What, how does it play out in practice, right? So for instance, in the chapter on justice, you know, treating, basically judging people objectively, treating them accordingly. I talk about some examples like with roommates, you know, he's not pulling up his end of the bargain and so on and forgiveness um, or judging people at work in annual review. Now, it's not that I go into, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent when it's not like case studies and that sort of analysis, but I try in each chapter to really use a number of examples to try to show how, you know, this, yeah, this is how honesty applies and you're not helping yourself if you're lying to yourself about your husband's become an alcoholic and this isn't what it was and so on. So that that's a resource in that, again, I go through the major virtues. I also have some discussion in there of things that most people think are virtues. And I ask now, where does Rand stand on charity or generosity? Or um, I forget the other two I've got in there. I think temperance uh, and uh, I'm forgetting the other one. At any rate, so it tries to put her account of, look, this is moral virtue. This is egoism. These are egoistic virtues. Well, how are they egoistic and how would they apply and guide in real life? Now, she says a little bit on each of those things in some of her writings. And there's a, a terrific book um, by Leonard Peikoff, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. I don't know if you've heard of that, but he's got a chapter on the good and I forget if it's a separate chapter on the virtues, but he's got, so I, he'll have seven or eight pages on each of the virtues. My book tries to go further, you know, building really on what he said, just go even further. I won't say deeper because it's hard to, it's not deeper in a certain sense at all. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you want to be thinking about how to practice this stuff and how does it, you know. Yeah. There are a lot of lectures actually available um, through, so the Ayn Rand Institute still makes a lot of lectures given by all sorts of objectivist scholars and philosophers available on applying some of the virtues in practice and applying some of the other normative principles in practice. So the Ayn Rand Institute website is one I would go to, to try to find where they have um because they have some courses you can, I mean, they have both courses you can sign up for and pay for, but they also have things that lots of this is available for free. Um, okay, thank you. Sure. I also think partly the answer is that, uh, to summarize, is that it is a very context dependent. So but we don't have an algorithm, we have to figure it out for ourselves. But also I think that books like the latest one by you Tara are simply great ways of teaching how to apply egoism by discussing some of the major misconceptions uh like like you said the long-term view of egoism and self-interest versus short-term and you also have uh, have that idea of accidental sacrifice uh maybe you could you could uh you could elaborate on this. Yeah, so that that's the kind of thing I was referring to earlier. Um, so I came up with these terms like accidental altruism, where you don't mean to be doing it, but you know, because no, I'm an egoist. You know, I'm I, I accept objectivist ethics and so on. But you find yourself again. I think this this goes back to the you haven't fully expelled from your system the inclinations to make the sacrifice or, oh, well, I got to keep my mother happy. Well, no, you don't have to keep, you know, but it's just so entrenched in you. And it's so the way that you've always done things that reflexively, oh yeah, that's what I got. No, you don't. So that's the kind of, again, that would be an example of the sort of hangover effect that's still there or the baggage that we still have that you have to, again, being conscious is what helps you notice, oh, why did I do that? Excuse me. <coughs> there was no good, I didn't have any good reason to do it. I mean, sometimes you want it, sometimes you should do what's gonna please your mother, okay? Even if it's a little inconvenient for you, I'm not saying that's always wrong, 
But the idea is, you know, try to understand why you're doing what you're doing. And sometimes you will find, man, I was lapsing into acting on premises that I no longer actually accept. So yeah, accidental altruism is kind of thing I talk about a little bit in there. Stephen raised his hand. So Stephen, you are, you're welcome to, to jump in. Hi, Dr. Smith. Uh, I haven't received my copy of your new book yet, but I'm already curious about if you're uh, planning on going further in this direction on this topic. Do you have a next project in the works specifically on egoism? Um, I don't, uh, actually, right now. Um, thank you for your interest. No, I don't right now. Um, I mean, I have another topic I'm working on, but it's it's not completely unrelated, but it's not digging more into the ethics per se. I'm, I'm working on some questions about privacy, which I do think is a great value. Uh, I'm also interested in some of the legal, political aspects of privacy. But I do think privacy is not sufficiently appreciated simply as a value in people's lives. And I think the connections there with egoism are kind of interesting. And I haven't yet figured those out at all. I'm in a very early exploratory stage there. But I will say one thing, I'm flirting with, should I do something on altruism? Uh, you know, I can't tell you when I write a book, <laughs> there's so much that just ends up on the cutting room floor. Now, you know, it only gets to certain stages before I cut it. And early on, I realized, you know, so many of these notes I was accumulating on altruism have to go. But the pile, I'm looking longingly, longingly and dreadingly at some of the piles over there on the uh, on the file cabinet that are just about altruism. And do I want to write something on altruism? So that's a related thing, but that's very iffy as to what I would do. And anyway, I could say a lot more about that, but, but no, I'm not, uh, I had done a lot of ethics work. Then I really got into philosophy of law for many years and I knew I wanted to get back to the ethics. So this last book uh, is the book that got me back to some ethics work. And I definitely want to be talking about this some more, but I'm not right now pursuing anything directly on egoism. Thank you. I uh, look forward to it. Sure. And no project left behind. Yeah, no, there's God, there's so many other things to do too, but the privacy stuff is kind of, there's a million questions there um, and they're hard and they're even just, again, just the moral one. I've had a lot of good discussions with objectivist intellectuals and we all disagree, which is wonderful in a way, but it's like, e, you know, and he's really smart and he's saying that, but I don't think he's right there, but I haven't figured out what's wrong with what I think he's saying. So, Here's back the, to those, oh, sorry, uh, Gary, Jerry, go, go on. I was wondering what the reaction has been maybe in your colleagues or when, when you produce it, because I'm assuming when you're producing your books and not just for objectivist audience, but for maybe a broader academic audience or just audience period. All right. What's, what's, yeah. what's mm -hmm. the reaction? It's varied. Um, I mean, there are some people, you know, in the field who just don't take objectivism seriously at all and don't think that anybody should. So I think that some of them consider it an embarrassment that, that I'm doing this work. Um, that's some, uh, many are just very respectful, you know, people have their own interests and so on. Now it is significant that Rand's work has gotten a much warmer academic reception in general over the last 20 years or so. Now, much warmer from a very, you know, from like sub freezing temperatures or, or sub zero temperatures to begin with, good Canadian, Western Canada temperatures. Okay. Um, to begin with, but still the, uh, there's been so much more good, serious scholarship, you know, some of it critical, but on R Rand's work that she's become much more accepted in the academy for, you know, serious consideration. And some issues in particular, including her ethics, really intersects with a lot of what contemporary ethicists are talking about when they talk about virtue ethics, when they talk about theories of well-being and flourishing and so on. Well, she's got useful things to say in those areas, and that obviously gains respect. I know in, in philosophy of science, 
and some epistemology. I think some of the, there's, there've been some good pieces have come out uh, discussing her work in those areas as well. What, one last follow-up. In Silicon sure. Valley, maybe Ryan Holiday, I think it's Holiday or Holiday, has seemed to got a lot of traction around like um, stoicism and things like that. It seems to have mass marketed that, that idea. And yet it seems to me that egoism would have a better fit for Silicon Valley, but maybe hasn't had that connection. And any thought, do you, are you familiar with his work and any thoughts on why? You know, I'm not, I know that name. As soon as you said the name, I've heard the name a lot. I haven't read any of his work so I'm, and I'm not really very familiar with his work, but I'm glad you raised that because I think, because this whole stoicism thing, stoicism, like Buddhism in certain ways, one, one from what I know of them, right? Uh, I mean, one of the important ideas there is we were talking earlier about desires. Like detach, distance, don't get so bothered, right? Get bloody hot and bothered, objectivism says, right? Now, think it through what you're doing, okay? But no, I mean, the way, the way to happiness is not to renounce or suppress or detach from your desires. It's to figure out what do I really want? Like, yeah, I have these different feelings and desires, but yeah, what kind of life, what kind of that do I want for myself? Like, what kind of work do I enjoy doing and thrive on doing? So in that sense, yes, definitely. I think egoism, rational egoism rant, has a very realistic picture on what makes a good life. And, and desire, as opposed to detachment, uh, plays an important role. In, I mean, a, a, a crucial role in that. Yeah. But no, I think that's a really interesting connection um, to be pursuing. Actually, I, I hope more people do some more work on the differences between some of the Ryan Holiday type thing. And I think the, so the, the popularity of some of those ideas in Silicon Valley is itself a sign that people are looking for a philosophy, something, an integrated way of making sense of life. Yeah. Making, you know, I, I mean, whether you've ever taken a philosophy class or not, people wonder about what's it all for? What's the meaning of it? I mean, we have different ways of talking about this. We talk about it more when we're coming home from a funeral than, than every day, right? But like people have some sense and they want what they're doing to add up and to mean something and so on. And yes, what it should mean, I mean, think about when you go to a wedding and you wish the young couple all the happiness in the world, right? I mean, what you're wishing for them, again, it goes back to where we started the, the conversation this evening, right? A good life, an ideal life, a flourishing life. You're not talking about ego, you, you know, well-being. It's not so you too can be a Sam Bankman freed and, you know, deceive people or something like, right? And the only problem with that kind of life is, oh, he got caught. But man, had he not gotten caught, he had it made. No, that's not what you want for your children. That's not what you want for the young couple, right? You want people to be flourishing, to be leading good lives themselves, not just to have, you know, wealth handed to them on a plate. You want them to be doing things that they're invested in, that are genuinely valuable, that they're feeling rewarded from and so on. So, yeah. Many things to talk about here, as we can see. So, Tara, partly your book is, is addressed to objectivists. And do you have any, do you have in mind any ways that even objectivists fail in applying egoism that, uh, that you explore in the book? Well, I mean, if, uh, I'm inclined to say, well, of course. I mean, we all, you know, we all make mistakes in different ways and of different types and for different reasons. But uh, the reason, you know, this book is in some ways more pitched for people who are already pretty inclined toward objectivism because it's mistakes that I think it's really easy to make, even if you're a conscientious, uh, you know, as I like to think of myself, objectivist of, you know, of, who's read a lot of material many times over and you would think would know better. And it's like, hey, I didn't know better there. I made that stupid mistake. And, you know, it's not, it's not autobiography exactly, but it's, I think these are things that I've seen other friends do as well. So, you know, we just, we go fast in life. 
and we don't check our premises enough or think enough or take the time to introspect. And that's how a lot of mistakes are made just by, man, we go fast. Because the and as the the pace of life, the expectations of speed uh, seem to have, you know, as those have gone up in recent years, you can get, you know, it seems more important to just do it now, decide now. And so it's like, whoa, I don't know what I think about this issue. I need to think about that. And I'm not going to be able to think about it anytime soon. Okay, I've got to be on the fence for a while. As opposed, like, sorry, I don't know. I understand what you're saying. And I understand what he's saying, but I still have these doubts. And so, right, I don't know. Very uncomfortable for a lot of people, right? So they've got to be quick to make a decision, have a stand. I know what I think about this candidate or that issue. And so issues are complicated. I don't know what I think about everything, you know? So I, I think speed and wanting to have a position sometimes rather than wanting to have, I want to, I want to figure out what's real here. What would the right policy be here? You know, are both sides, the major sides, all making similar mistakes underneath and so on? So slowing down is something I think we all could do more of for various reasons. But of course, I say that having just recently gotten back from vacation when you're in a little, you're trying to, you're trying to live and keep that slow down uh, idea. One of the things that you also explore in the book is the issue that practicing egoism involves both, has both a factive side, which is non-psychological, but also has that psychological side. So it's it's both an I missed achievement. the word that you said, fact. Factual, I just wasn't sure what word you said. Yeah, factual, factual, factual. So it has a, so practicing egoism has a factual side and. Factual, but non-psychological side, but also involves, but also involves achieving a certain state of mind. So it's, it's both, it's both about achieving things in the ex external world as well as internal world. Uh, so do you think people make mistakes related to this issue when they try to be egoistic? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm not fully sure what you mean, and I don't talk in that language in the book, so I just want to be clear to a potential reader. Um So I'm not sure if this at all gets at what you're talking about. Sorry. But um, so let me know if not. OK. Uh, or, OK. Um, you know, there are things you can control. You can do your best at something. And sometimes for reasons beyond your control, what you did failed. Right. You can't hold yourself responsible. You can't hold yourself blameworthy in cases where you haven't done anything that you should not have done. Right. And I, you know, obviously we, so that's being realistic about what could I have controlled, what I could not have controlled. Now, as always, one needs to be honest with oneself because sometimes you could have done better and you should have, and you knew that. So you've got to be honest when, no, I deserve some self-condemnation there. But the, but, and again, why it's good to give that is so that I don't do that again. I don't want to do, yeah, you shouldn't have done that, Tara. That was, oh, okay, I'm going to be on the lookout for the temptation to do that again so that I don't do that again, right? So you've got to be honest with yourself. You've got to blame yourself when the blame is warranted, but you've got to exonerate yourself and not feel one feel or judge oneself responsible when one isn't, right? You've got to be realistic about the things you cannot control or cannot influence, Um so that again, you have a realistic picture of what you should be doing, how you should be doing things, understand we can't guarantee outcomes and so on. But I'm not sure if that's the kind of thing, if that gets to the kind of thing that you had in mind. Or... I more had in mind the issue that you begin, you begin one of your chapters uh, by saying that flourishing involves both fact and feeling. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Interesting. So yeah, I have a whole chapter. So in this new book, um, the first four chapters are on desires, 
one's fundamental sense of warrant or whether or not one needs a warrant to pursue happiness, independence and self-esteem. And then in the second part of the book, I have a whole chapter on what is self-interest, what is flourishing, and some of the essence of what Rand means by egoism, the pursuit of self-interest or flourishing, right? So yes, in the chapter on self-interest, flourishing, um, I talk about the fact that we all talk about happiness in a couple of different senses, quite commonly, without, we don't always distinguish them clearly. But sometimes when we're, when we say, you know, Sam is happy, what we mean is something like he's in a good mood or he feels good, right? He's satisfied with things. He's content. He's happy. Sometimes when we say Sam is happy, what we really mean is he's doing well. He's happy. His life is going well. So it's more a report on the objective state of affairs. You know, his values are flourishing. His new business, for instance, is really, it's taken off, it's doing well. His children are adjusting to the new school really well, right? His friendships are going well. I, you know, his blood pressure has come down and so on. So sometimes we mean it in this factual way. We're reporting on an objective state of affairs. He's flourishing you know, or he's not, or he's struggling or whatever it might be. Um, sometimes we mean it more in the, you know, he feels good, he's content, right? But ideally, you know, true flourishing is you are in fact doing well and you're conscious of that. You feel that, right? Yeah, I'm feeling good about things for good reason, because things are going well. I'm achieving my goals. I'm making progress toward that degree that I've been uh, you know, pursuing these last few years, or I'm, you know, this is you know, major values in my life. They are pro progressing in a good, positive direction. So yes, ideally you want the, you know, you want these two to be in sync. I feel good, not because I'm deluded, not because I'm evading or ignoring a lot of what's going on. I'm feeling good because I'm achieving my values. And that's what happiness is. The achievement, or that's where it comes from, the achievement of values. Yeah. So I'm glad I asked because now I now I get your question much more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's far far better wording. Mm -hmm. Let me know, Gary and Stephen, if if you would like to ask anything else. In, okay. Uh, in the in the meantime, uh, Tara, do you think? I mean, that... it's fine with me if you want to. You know, anytime you want to, and we don't need to drag this out yeah 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 uh one of the last things that I, I would like to ask you about is that what do you, are there any precursors to Ayn Rand that you would like to single out that maybe would show that she's not that controversial as people imagine she's not simply saying something no one has ever said in any way I mean, there have been other people in the history of philosophy who, again, I mean, there have been other people who've taken on the label of egoist, but their views are pretty different. And even of those who have some views that are, I mean, you know, I mentioned Aristotle earlier. I think there's a hell of a lot seriously, seriously wrong with Aristotle's ethics. Um, and it's in some ways a great ethics because he's got the basic right idea of, yeah, human flourishing, but it, it's, no, I mean, she really is radical. Uh, she's a radical for egoism and radically different in what she is saying about what genuine self-interest is. Again, I mean, the, yeah. So um, she's an original and I really do recommend those two essays of hers that I referred to earlier in the little book, The Virtue of Selfishness, her short introduction, and then her longer essay on the objectivist ethics. It can be very reorienting from the way most of us are raised to think about ethics. We just take it for granted. It's just a given, like the sky above us. And again, she, why? Where do these ideas of value, good, bad, right, wrong, should, shouldn't, 
ought, oughtn't. Where do they come from? What gives them any traction? And her answer makes so much sense when she talks about, again, the scientific or causal facts of we live depending dependent on meeting our needs. In order to meet our needs, we need to figure out what our needs are and what we must do to fulfill our needs. We have all sorts of needs, from the most base, obvious physical needs to the most sophisticated, psychological, emotional needs, right? But it's figuring that all out that shows us the path toward achieving the good life, the, the happy life, the flourishing. I think this is an excellent point to conclude with. So thank you so much, Tara, for joining us today. It's been a true pleasure. Thank I you. think we have a lot of great content that all of people will appreciate. Uh, so it was wonderful to talk to you. Thank you, everyone well, who attended. Yeah. And thank you. I mean, it was a nice, intimate uh, group, but I really appreciate everybody's interest. Thanks a lot. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Uh, okay. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Ark. This was fun. I hope it was okay for you, but it was it was fun.